Welcome to the Moss Report, with your host, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. Hi, and welcome to the Moss Report podcast. This is your host, Ralph Moss. Today we have a very uh, special guest, Tafik Owanikoko, and uh, his his resume is is really pretty fantastic. He's the co-founder of Cambium Oncology, uh, a a company in Atlanta, Georgia, that is developing uh, drugs and new innovative treatments for cancer, I think especially lung cancer. Um, He was or is still uh, the vice chairman of Emory University School of Medicine and uh, has been a professor at Emory and associate vice chair for faculty development uh, for uh, for several years. Um, he's also associated, has been associated with the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory and uh, just basically has this amazing resume with hundreds of, of articles. Uh, I think I counted 228 as of this morning uh, in PubMed and on many topics. And uh, so welcome to the, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dr. Maas. Um, and it's, I, I think we'll have, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Uh, and basically, I think what, what we want to, you know, you've, you've researched a number of different areas of, of interest to our listenership, but the things that we want to focus on today have mostly to do with the nature, I would say, of, of clinical trials how they how representative are these clinical trials really of what goes on in the in the real world and particularly what is the situation vis-a-vis the participation of minority groups uh, in in the clinical trial system a topic that by the way I touched on in my last book cancer incorporated and I'll, I'll just note for our listenership that uh, uh, I hate these terms of race and, you know, categorizing people by color and so forth, but this is the way that the census does it and so forth. And it says that white people as of 2017 constituted 73% of the population. But if you look at non-Hispanic whites, that's just 60, 60.7%. And that, that, share is expected to fall below 50% by the year 2045. Uh, and so, in other words, the U.S. becomes a quote-unquote minority-majority country. Uh, and, you know, we're already in 2021, so that isn't so far away. And I know I, you came to my attention uh, primarily because you co-authored a study that was in the ASCO educational book in 2019 on diversity in immunotherapy trials. So these trials for the for the listeners are of one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting class of new cancer drugs, mostly immune checkpoint inhibitors, which uh, have had a major impact, right, on lung cancer population and on melanoma and uh, have a great deal of potential and promise. So it's very important to know how representative the populations are, right, that these are being tested in. So could you just briefly summarize uh, for the listenership, first of all, what was your what was your inspiration for doing this study and what did you find? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we're touching on a very important uh, topic uh, for the medical community, but for the society at large. Uh, which is cancer remains a deadly disease. Uh, Fortunately for us all, over the last couple of decades, we've really made gigantic advances uh, in different aspects of cancer care, um, including early diagnosis and prevention, and more recently also with new therapeutics. And I will focus on two main categories of therapies that we now have in our armamentarium that we did not have 20, 30 years ago. Uh, One is targeted therapy, uh, which is a way for us 
to target specific changes within the uh, cancer genome. Uh, we know that there could be unique changes within cancer cells that drives the growth of cancer. And the development of agents to target these changes within the cancer DNA, so to say, has paved the way for a lot of therapeutic uh, interventions, mostly in terms of oral drugs that we now use for you know, cancer ranging from breast cancer to ovarian cancer and uh, lung cancer being the, I think, where we've had the most success for this type of targeted intervention. Uh, more recently, we've now switched gears in, in terms of our uh, focus to immunotherapy, which is now harnessing the body's own immune system to fight cancer. Uh, we have, at the last count, maybe six different drugs now in this category uh, in different tumor types that have been approved for treating cancer of various types. Why these are important uh, advances that we've made and they're benefiting patients across the board. What we also recognize is that how we test these drugs before they come to the clinic for regular use uh, could have a significant impact on how we can optimize the benefit. So we want to make sure that patients who will use these drugs when they are finally approved they are well represented during the earlier stages of the development of this agent. So under representation of so-called minority population in the U.S., for instance, has been a recognized problem going back three decades. The NIH has tried different approaches to try to address this, uh, both in terms of policy and uh, you know, incentives, but we know that for 20 years, really the needle has not moved. And now that we are moving into a new era of cancer therapy, where we are relying not so much on the drug we are giving to the patient, but on the patient's own body's immune system, we start to wonder whether or not underrepresentation of key segments of the society in these trials uh, could be uh, you know, resulting in missed opportunities. Uh, are we able to learn more if we have everybody included in the trial in terms of how the drug works, where it works in, and what type of side effect to anticipate? Uh, so that was really the impetus for our wanting to look at whether or not this age-old problem uh, continues to bedevil the cancer drug development space, even in the era of immunotherapy. Yes. And uh, it was good that we got the invitation from ASCO, being an area that they also focus on, to at least drill down on where the situation is. And that is why I worked along with one of my colleagues here at Emory, Dr. Basil Nazar, you know, to look at some of the key clinical trials that led to approval of immunotherapy, specifically in lung cancer, but also in other cancer types. And uh, look at the breakdown of patients who went on to those clinical trials and try to understand whether there are opportunities to do better. And maybe there are some lessons learned or lessons that we still haven't learned because we didn't have those patients uh, included in the trial. And um, in addition to the article that you referred to from ASCO education book that we wrote, uh, more recently we published a study out of Emory where we looked at our own population. We are lucky at Emory that we have a diverse uh, community and our minority enrollment on trials is very high compared to an average cancer center in the US. But the population that we also serve is enriched for minority population, especially patients of African ancestry. Mm -hmm. So we're able to look at our own internal data to look at how do these drugs work when we use them in uh, patients of European ancestry compared to those of Asian or African uh, origin. Yeah. And what did you find? So interestingly, um, what we found was that if you treat patients uh, with this agent, regardless of their uh, ancestral background, 
uh, they work just as well. Uh, in fact, it, while it is very small, I do not want to make any, you know, uh, firm conclusion that we don't have robust data to support yet. When we compare the outcomes of patients of African background treated at our institution in the era of chemotherapy to white patients, for instance, there's always been this lag in outcome where it's a little bit inferior for blacks versus white. When we look at the impact of immunotherapy between the two populations, that difference actually disappeared, mm -hmm. um, which raises the question whether or not uh, there is some additional benefit that you see uh, in blacks when treated with immunotherapy uh, versus white, or it could just be the mix of population that were the patient population that we looked at. So that's why I'm saying that I do not want to, you know, uh, make any firm conclusion without strong data. But what we can conclude from the data we have is that the benefit of immunotherapy was no different, whether we gave it to somebody of Asian, African, or European ancestry. What we did see um, to be different, though, uh, is the type of side effect. So the toxicity that you get from immunotherapy. And um, we historically, we know that certain autoimmune conditions, uh, when they happen to patients of African ancestry, they tend to be more severe. So if you think of lupus, for instance, lupus diagnosis in a black person is more likely to be um, associated with other additional organ damage than if you look at the Caucasian. So there's always been this concern in the background that are we going to find the same type of problem with immunotherapy? Because basically what we're trying to do is wake up the body's immune system. And if we do it too much, uh, the side effect will look like somebody with autoimmune condition. Right. So there was the concern that maybe when we do this uh, uh, in uh, blacks versus white, we might find that the drugs would be much more toxic in blacks. Uh, fortunately, that is not what we found. Uh, we actually also saw that the, um, the safety is comparable uh, between this population the frequency, though, uh, seems to be a little bit uh, different. Uh, when, you, um, when you look at what we call immune-related adverse events, uh, we found out in about 20% of Blacks and in about 30% of white patients. Um, statistically, why that number looked, you know, the difference looked substantial, you know, 20% versus 30%. Yeah. Uh, when you subject that to statistical analysis, it actually did not meet uh, the statistical threshold to conclude that it is different. So we just said, you know, it appears that you're going to see a little bit more of immune-related adverse events in white compared to blacks. We are in the process of working with our colleagues at other institutions where they take care of, you know, diverse patient population to see if we can replicate uh, this observation and perhaps if we pull additional data sets together, maybe yeah. we'll start uh, getting a better sense of what is going on. You need a, you need a larger sample in order to be able to reach a Correct. conclusion. Yeah. And, you know, now with the real world evidence that um, we are all relying on, I think as we have more and more of this data curated in some of the real world evidence companies, you know, um, perhaps that would be a very useful platform mm -hmm. to go to to answer this sort of question of, you know, people treated in their regular clinic, not as part of a clinical trial. Right. Uh, we can start to look at whether or not this uh, profile of adverse events are comparable or different. This has always been the concern, right? That, you know, the, the drugs are approved based upon uh, clinical trials, hopefully randomized controlled trials. But mm -hmm. if the patient population is not representative of the general population, the, the concern has been that you're going you're gonna to cherry pick the patient mm -hmm. 
into it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm making it, you know, deliberate, but whatever. Uh, yeah. you pick the patients going into the clinical trial, you get a significant result. Then you release the drug f- as the FDA does for the general population. Mm-hmm. Does that, do, do those results still apply? Um, and it isn't, I, I would remark that it isn't just the, um, the, the, the so-called racial background of people who mm-hmm. are part of the same race, but you know what I, what I mean to, to what's called yeah. racial background. Uh, mm-hmm. is it, ju- it isn't just that, it's also age, uh, the yeah. exclusion of, of people over a certain age, 60 or 65, mm-hmm. when, the can- when the average cancer patient is getting cancer in somewhere usually in their 60s, uh, past yeah. age that um, is being allowed into the trial. And then uh, income is another factor, the socioeconomic status of the population and just the inherent um, difficulties for poor people to participate Mm -hmm. in clinical trials. So I think it's a pervasive pattern that encompasses a number of different factors. And this so-called racial one is a big big part of it. It's encouraging that Mm -hmm. you're not seeing uh, a lesser effect among black people uh, taking the immunotherapy. Um, I wonder though, what, you know, what, what you attribute that to? What, what do you think is going on? Just to speculate, why would that be? Yeah. So, you know, I think you touched on a number of uh, important factors when it comes to cancer clinical trials and clinical trials in general. Uh, which is you want the population where you are testing your intervention to be truly representative of where you're going to uh, apply the drug when it is eventually approved. Uh, You know, age, gender, those are important considerations, just as important as we've been talking about with race. Um, You know, there is actually some school of thought, I know of some of our colleagues in the field, um, who will tell you that, you know, a lot of things that we read out to be racial differences, if you control for access to care, those differences disappear. Yeah. Maybe not entirely, but to a significant degree. Uh, that perhaps race being a social and political construct I may not have as much of a biological relevance as socioeconomic status. You know, I think the argument is there both ways. There is, for, we know for sure there are certain uh, drugs, for instance, that will have unique side effects in certain population. You know, there are some chemotherapy drugs. They cause a lot more side effects in Japanese patients than they do in Western patients, whether black or white. Right. Uh, but in the development of those drugs, if you never had the opportunity to give it to a Japanese patient, you define the dose based on the Western population as this is the safe dose to use. Now all of a sudden you bring it into the Japanese population and you start seeing a lot of diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, uh, suggesting to you that while the drug is the right drug, the dose is the wrong dose for that population of patients. So uh, the same will apply to older patients because disparity can also be in form of age. You know, lung cancer, for instance, the median age of diagnosis is 70 years. A lot of our trials, when you want to enroll patients, you have all these requirements for you to go on. Kidney function has to be good. Heart function has to be good. But these are things that we know that as we all age, they are less likely to be uh, in top pristine condition. So just by the design of the trial, you systematically uh, create the disincentive for older patients to qualify and to participate in those trials, even if that was not your intention. But um, it is comforting to some degree now that people are recognizing this, both the NCI as well as ASCO. They've empaneled a group of people to look at how we all come up with these eligibility criteria, what purpose do they serve? Are these just legacy documents that we keep, you know, carrying over into clinical trials without thinking it through whether or not they actually enhance safety uh, during the conduct of the trial? And uh, if they don't, maybe we get away from them. 
one particular example, for instance, ASCO is now making the case uh, about brain metastasis. You know, a lot of trials in the past will say, oh, a patient with cancer in the brain that has spread to the brain will not be able to come to their trial. But you have certain conditions where those drugs are being tested, where maybe 30, 40% of patients will develop evidence of the cancer in the brain. And in the lung cancer space, for instance, uh, not necessarily by design, but by accident, we started to see that some of the targeted therapies actually have just as good an effect in the brain as they have outside the brain, to the extent now that in the field, the movement is now to the other side of if somebody has brain metastasis and you think the drug should be able to get into the brain, you don't have to exclude them. You don't even have to mandate that they get radiation to the brain before they come on the trial. As long as you have a systematic way of monitoring them, those patients will not be allowed to come on trial. The last aspect I want to touch about uh, is location of those trials. Uh, the reason why we were able to do the small study I mentioned to you uh, is because we have a patient population that is sort of reflective of the entire U.S. population. At Emory, we have a diverse population, Blacks, Hispanics, Whites. So by looking at the patient that we treat, we could go back and ask the question that we ask, how effective is the immunotherapy in Blacks if compared to White, Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do clinical trials where your trial is situated or, you know, open at site where the type of patient they treat is of one particular race, by design, you're not going to see the other uh, population that you, you are interested in because your study is not open there. So yeah. I think democratizing the way studies are positioned and where they are placed uh, in addition to, you know, direct engagement with patients of minority background uh, would also go a long way. And I think it contributes to why uh, we don't have as many minority patients enrolled on trial. Yes. Uh, maybe the point, for instance, when we looked at all the clinical trials that led to approval of immunotherapy drugs in lung cancer, and we counted the total number of Blacks enrolled across those trials, we could not even count up to 20 patients. Hmm. And out, these are out, out, of how, out of how many? And these are trials that enrolled thousands of patients. Oh my God. Right? Yes. Uh, so you start wondering um, how could that be representative of the patient who will eventually use these drugs? Uh, but within um, within our own institution, you know, when we went back and we looked at our patients of uh, African uh, uh, ancestry, we were able to look at substantial number of patients, much bigger than all the black patients enrolled on at least five of those early immunotherapy trials uh, of lung cancer. None of those trials enrolled twenty patients of uh, uh, black ancestry. Uh, most of them, maybe 10 patients, 15 patients, maybe three patients, even in some. Yeah. Uh, but within our own single institution, we're able to pull the record for close to 100 patients. Uh, so it's reassuring that we saw the result that we, f we saw that, you know, it was equally beneficial. But the problem is Long term, look, looking down the road, we know that these drugs don't work in every patient to the same degree. And part of what we focus on now is finding those patients who will benefit so that we allocate the drugs to the right group of patients and minimize the exposure of those who will not benefit. Yeah. So biomarker development. There is no way where that is more critical than in immunotherapy that we develop biomarker in different patient populations. Uh, make sure that our, our biomarkers are validated across all these populations because it's not impossible, you know, that over millennia, over generations, you know, there's a lot of diversity in our body's immune uh, makeup 
uh, if you look at HLA typing and things like that, uh, the distribution in the Caucasian population is different than in the Asian population is different than in the Black population. And we know that this could be a mechanism by which patient might or might not respond to treatment. So using the appropriate population of patients to validate biomarkers as we continue to develop immunotherapy, I think is critical, if not more critical, than even getting the patient on the, those uh, early trials that we've been talking about. Yes. No, that's a, good, a very good, very, very good point. And there's been a lot of confusion over what the markers are for immunotherapy, because if you go back just a couple of years, everybody was focused on PD-1, PD-L1. That was considered, the expression of PD-L1 was considered definitive, and that would be how mm -hmm. you decide whether somebody was admitted into a trial. And then it over time, not a long time, it suddenly changed to this question of the tumor mutational burden, TMB, mm -hmm. um, or markers of the degree of yeah. mutation within within the cancer, and it's led to a lot of confusion. And then you see even statements in textbooks now saying, well, actually, people respond even without elevated PD, PD-1 or PD-L1. So yeah. I think it's an area of, of a, a lot of promise, as you say, but also a, a lot of confusion. I want to just play the devil's advocate for a second. Um, what would you think about uh, two things? One would be open enrollment into clinical trials. And then the second thing would be, what about compensating people to be in these clinical trials because, I mean, first of all, the drug companies are going to reap enormous profits if they get, if they get approval of these $150,000 uh, drugs. Secondly, um, a lot of the barriers, I would think, to the participation of poor people is just the logistics, getting to the site of the trial, uh, stay, having your, staying overnight, having your relatives stay overnight, uh, the transportation, the loss of, of, of work time and so forth. What would be the harm, since we're talking about billion dollar products, uh, what would be the harm in paying poorer people, especially poorer people, to take part in these trials? Yeah, those are really questions from the devil's advocate as you described it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a politician, but I hang out with some. So I will try to be as uh, objective in my response as possible. Okay. So by open enrollment, you mean allowing people to just try drugs and not worry so much about inclusion, exclusion? Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. If they have a, okay. if they have a confirmed diagnosis, yeah. why not take, uh, take all comers, uh, basically, as long as they're legitimate? Yeah, so there is actually something to be said for having appropriate inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, because in drug development, what we want to do is we want to make haste, but slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be efficient in developing drugs. I think while open enrollment might sound appealing, like, you know, we are democratizing the process, everybody gets uh, the opportunity to get on the trial. Mm -hmm. Actually, paradoxically, that could slow down the development of those drugs and uh, how long it takes for them to get into regular use in the community. Um, why did I say that? A lot of the drugs that we are developing these days are very targeted. And if you don't come up with a reliable, albeit equitable way of identifying those patients that will go on your trial, you may actually have a lot of patients that will come on that you don't expect to benefit based on what you understand of the target and the drug. So that eventually will slow everything down. As you know, some of the very, very interesting compounds that have come to the market in the last five to 10 years. They actually started with small companies 
that eventually got bought over by big companies. Right. And when right. small companies are trying to develop this, uh, they don't have as much resources. So you want to make sure that you are a good steward of the resource you are putting into the clinical trial uh, uh, space and then get the answer that you need to get so that you can move that forward and eventually get it approved. Now, there is something to be said. There are other mechanisms that perhaps we all can uh, advocate for, which is once a drug has gotten to the point where it is close to being approved, uh, there is the, you know, through the FDA, the expanded access program or the single patient IND mechanism, Mm -hmm. And to say that I know this drug is going to work in this type of patient, but this patient is not able to get on the clinical trial for one reason or the other. Then having that expanded access program for a drug that we already know how it works, we know the right dose, we know the type of side effect to watch out for, I think would be a way to get a lot more patient access to those drugs even before they get full approval. The second point about compensation um, the I think there is two components to that. There is compensation that uh, we need to look at in terms of you know patient effort. One can look and say, oh, we are giving them drugs to help treat their cancer, but we also know that majority of patients that go on this trial don't benefit from the early phase trials until yeah. know until we know what is going on. But what we don't want to do is come up with an inducement that will force people to take on unnecessary risks. And especially when you throw out the point about, you know, uh, le relatively uh, less resource people in terms of finances, you know, when people are desperate for financial support and you have a trial that say, okay, come and join my trial, I will give you this, I will give you that. Uh, it's possible we're all human that that could be tempting for someone to sign up for something that ordinarily they would not sign up for. And I know that a lot of IRBs will look into whether or not uh, any type of compensation that is being offered as part of a trial will rise to the level of undue inducement. Yeah. My own philosophical take is there are certain things that can be paid for by the trial that would help patients across the board but it will have greater impact on patients who do not have as much resources, things like you mentioned. So some of these trials, we have patients come in every day for blood sampling, which ordinarily you wouldn't do. You know, in some places, patients will go in, they have to pay for parking, they have to pay for gas, they have to, you know, maintain their vehicles. Those are things I feel justifiably studies should be able to reimburse patients for. Um, we know that some of the reasons why people of, uh, uh, you know, middle-aged patients, for instance, as opposed to older patients, may not be as willing to enroll on trial, especially women when they have uh, uh, school-age kids, is the number of times they have to take from work uh, to go for re trial-related uh, um, activities. So coming up with mechanism to support them on the home front when they are coming to the centers for clinical trial-related activities, I think would also be an equitable way to support patients on trial. But it shouldn't just be a matter of I write you a one thousand dollar check because ultimately you are going to make a billions uh, billions out of this when it is approved. Uh, we have to look at things that will actually impact patients positively, uh, support them to be able to be part of the trial while not slowing down the overall pace at which you want to get those uh, drugs developed and approved. Uh, yeah, you make a, a very good case uh, for that. But I guess my nightmare is that uh, a drug, that the drug company, the system, I won't say it's just the drug mm. But the system is set up to maximize the chance of the drug being approved. So you have a drug, you you cherry pick the patients in order to have the greatest chance of, of getting. I'm sorry, we're getting some feedback here. Uh oh. Oh, what's happening? Sorry, yeah. it was on my end. Oh, okay. 
Well, that's a little break time there for you, Rachel. You can make a, make a break. So I was saying that my nightmare is that the uh, the patient selection, the, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, that's the selection mm-hmm. process yeah. trial, just to explain, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, will be arranged in such a way to maximize the chance that the drug will be approved. Then, so that's the efficacy of the drug. But then mm-hmm. it's released into the general patient population. That's the effectiveness of the drug. And right. the efficacy is not, is not always the same as the effectiveness. And we've seen this happen over the years. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was a famous instance with gemcitabine when it was first Mm -hmm. introduced, gems are, where I think it was Eli Lilly uh, released data showing certain amount of activity in the drug. The drug got approved and then they were required and and drug companies generally are supposed to do phase Mm -hmm. four clinical trials, which are basically post-marketing, post-market trials, meaning after, this is what I'm talking about, after the drug is is approved and released, they're supposed yeah. to go back then, look at the over the impact in the overall patient population. Yeah. Half the time, I am I according to some press reports, half the time the companies are not doing that. And there's no punishment uh, from FDA. The FDA figures they have their hands full with a lot of other things, especially in the COVID time. So they're not really enforcing that. But when you when that's done, some of the time and I don't want to, I can't give you exact figure, but some of the time the drug that quote unquote was efficacious in the clinical trial turns out statistically not to be effective in the general population. And I think that's, that, that looks suspiciously like a system designed to maximize the profits of these enormous nine drug companies that basically control the cancer uh, market uh, where they can get away with charging $150,000 or more uh, per patient. So hmm. I, I would just say that it, you know, maybe I'm being a little conspiratorial, but it just looks, it looks fishy that you can get a drug approved that doesn't work. And even if, even if it doesn't work in the, in the if they do the phase four trial, the mm-hmm. post-market trial, it could be years and years before that drug ever is, is actually pulled from the market. It almost never happens. You remember when the 20 years ago or something, the, the Margaret Hamburg, the yeah. FDA commissioner, pulled mm-hmm. Avastin for um, advanced breast cancer. Right. Yeah. It was an yeah. enormous uproar over that yeah. thing. Why? Because it didn't, in her view, and I think most people's view, it didn't work in that setting. Yeah. But it was it was such a rare event that the FDA actually enforced its own rules. So I, I guess yeah. I, it's not a question exactly, but I'd like you to respond to it anyway. I mean, do you feel that that this is a level playing field? You're in. You're now. You have a company develop, presumably developing products. Is this a level playing field where where everybody has to play by the same rules or has big pharma tipped the field in its own favor so that it's more likely to get its drugs approved. And then it acts half the time acts irresponsibly and never lets you know, you know, the the other shoe never drops. In other words, you don't ever get to hear, oh, well, this didn't actually uh, rise to statistical significance when we tested it in the real patient population. Yeah, so I think, and let me just be upfront and um, address the big elephant in the room. You know, while I'm, I'm a founder of a company that is trying to develop cancer drug, we don't have any drug currently that's close to approval or clinic. Yeah. And I'm not speaking on behalf of that company. This is just my own personal opinion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for someone who, apart from, you know, working in the, in the commercial space with a company, uh, treating patients, I also work in the lab in terms of trying to find new drugs. 
And, you know, we recognize this fact about efficacy and uh, effectiveness uh, because you cannot get to effectiveness without showing efficacy. And we see the same thing, you know, when we do experiments in the lab, it is very easy to show that a drug is doing something when we are playing with the cell lines. Yeah. It's a little bit more difficult to show it in animals. So you always see that drop off. Something looks like it killed, you wiped everything off when you apply it to a cancer cell in the Petri dish. Then you administer that same to, you know, uh, mice that is, you know, carrying tumor and say, oh, it's not killing all the, the tumor in the mice. So you always see that drop off. And the reason for that is the biological system is much more complex than just pouring uh, chemicals onto the cell in a petri dish where all the cells get exposed uh, to the drug. Once you put it in the animal, there are a lot more that will come into play how much of it goes through the liver, how much gets excreted through the kidney before they get to where the cancer is and all of that, which you're very familiar with. So you can think of the same thing when you talk to developing drug in the clinic. So efficacy is easier to prove because you are doing a controlled so-called uh, trial where you tell the patient, this is what we want you to do. This is when we want you to do it. This is how you do it. Uh, to... It now gets approved. Everybody writes the drug, whatever it is for, you know, in Atlanta, in Ann Harbor, in Winnipeg, and wherever. Yeah. And you have different patients taking the drug and doing other things. You know, people is, at that point, they're not just focused on the cancer medicine you're giving them. They're also going about their daily lives. And that could involve things that we don't even know of because it wasn't part of the trial that potentially could limit the efficacy of the drug. So you would expect that in the real world, you are not likely to see a drug be more effective than what you show in the clinical trial. It is probably going to be a little bit less effective, but which is where the regulatory approval process becomes very, very important. If the threshold established by the regulatory authorities for approval is high enough, even that drop-off that you are going to see in the real-world use of the drug will still amount to significant benefits that will make it worth it. Why is it that companies are not following through and doing that type of uh, phase four trials that you're talking about? Because it is not mandatory. Yeah. And uh, if you want to mandate it, the question is always a trade-off. You know, what we always hear about the, why the drugs cost so much, why it's uh, $200,000 per year per patient is because it costs us so much to do the clinical trial, right? If you have to do phase four trial, you can think of a phase three trial that is showing efficacy. Maybe you are doing that in a thousand patients. A phase four trial to be meaningful because of all these other factors that you cannot control for. Now you are looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. And, you know, the company will just turn around and say, you know what, this is what we have to do. And that is now, instead of charging $150,000, I want to charge $300,000, <laughs> you know. Uh, so there is always going to be one reason or the other uh, for why the price is so high. Uh, but the other reason why phase four, phase four trials can be very tricky, especially in, uh, in, the, long, in the cancer space, is that Majority of our patients that we're treating, they are those with advanced stages of disease. And we know that even with our best uh, agents now, uh, we measure efficacy in months to maybe a couple of years. So the type of efficacy, effectiveness, effectiveness study that we want to see, if you are thinking of overall survival, it may actually get diluted out because Maybe you get one drug approved and the patient takes it and it works for them for only four months. But all of a sudden, there's a new drug in that space and they went on it. Mm -hmm. And if you're only capturing overall survival for those patients, you are now capturing not just the effectiveness of the original drug that you are testing, but also the impact of the new drug that is now becoming available for that patient to use. So I think it's much more complicated than just that we have to mandate it. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts, but I think what we have to, at least 
what I think is more practical is to ensure that we do not lose the criteria for efficacy. We don't water it too, too much that every drug gets approval just by showing some degree of benefit in small number of patients and now we move forward and there's no other way to show whether or not it's truly effective in the right. larger population of patients. Well, that leads I, to... That, that would be a more, more effective way to get this done. That leads me to my last question and the hardest question. And you sort of touched on this, and that is that the definition of efficacy, in other words, a lot of trials, I don't know the exact number, but I would estimate it's probably about half, are give, a lot of drugs are given accelerated approval by the FDA, meaning that yeah. the FDA officially believes that increased overall survival is really the measure and improvement in quality of life or maintenance mm. of quality of life is really the, the desired outcome of taking a, any treatment. But if the company can prove an increase in something like disease-free survival or progression-free survival, or even the response rate, which is a funny term, uh, mm -hmm. shrinkage of of the measurable tumors by used to be 50%. Now it's 30%. Mm -hmm. um, that that alone leads to approval of drugs where there are no other, you know, effective treatments in about half the cases. And as I say, a lot of times, even though the, they get the approval, the accelerated approval, but they never follow through with proving what I would call the true efficacy, which is that the drug actually delivers something of value to the patient. Because um, what does it mean to have progression-free survival if the two, two patients, one has progression-free survival and the other doesn't, and they both die at exactly the, the same, after the exactly the same length of time after getting the treatment, which could happen, um, and one drug gets approved and the other one doesn't, based upon we have impact on this progression, and it and you and it isn't necessarily true that the existence or the the creation of a, pro, a progression free interval is necessarily in the best interest of the patient. You could argue it both ways uh, about that. So, how do you feel about about that? How do we how do we guarantee that the effects of the drug, the effect, the efficacy of the drug, yeah. something of value to the patient, or mm -hmm. is it just a $150,000 or $200,000 uh, 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 illusion? Yeah. Yeah. So I would agree with you that um, in an attempt to facilitate drug development, we might be getting on this slippery slope uh, where the level of rigor and the, the strength of the evidence that we need to get drugs approved uh, appear to have weakened over the past, say, 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, I was reading through recently about accelerated drug approval, and I came across uh, a study that was reported done by uh, investigators at London School of Economics and Harvard, looking at drugs that were granted accelerated approval by the FDA. And you know, for the purpose of our audience, just to explain, um, FDA can grant accelerated approval based on sort of weak endpoint of efficacy, weak evidence of efficacy, but they believe that with time will mature to something that is, you know, stronger. So you're getting the drug out to patient based on soft evidence, but the evidence is lining up well that you believe that eventually would amount to strong evidence and then you give them full approval. So they looked and they said uh, more than 20 uh Drugs were given accelerated approval by the FDA, about 19 of those in cancer patients. And after three years of the accelerated approval, maybe less than half of those compounds 
drugs have actually been uh, substantially supported by additional trials to show yeah. that the initial accelerated approval was warranted. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the drugs were bad. I think it's just a matter of where the incentives are, the carrot and the stick. And that is perhaps a reflection of how stretched the FDA staff have become over the years. You know, when they only had to deal with maybe three or four companies with maybe two or three drugs to review in a year, to where you have all this explosion of uh, small startups, each one with its own compound, everybody wants an FDA approval and, you know, paying for uh, uh, quick review. So the burden of review on the FDA, I think, has gotten so much that even when the mandate for confirmatory trials be completed, there is no set timeline of when it has to be done. Right. right. Maybe one way to address that is to have a sunsetting clause as an incentive for the companies to not slack up after they got the accelerated approval of, you have this accelerated approval for three years or for four years. And if you don't bring the evidence, we're not saying your drug is bad, but we're going to suspend that approval until you give us the additional evidence that we need. I think that will encourage the companies to do the follow-through and the follow-up uh, studies uh, that will really solidify the, the, effi- the evidence that they're presenting to the FDA. Yeah. Um, the surrogate endpoint concern, I think it's real. Uh, you know, we used to be that nobody would take anything uh, to be serious evidence until you've shown overall survival advantage. And then we gradually move from there to, okay, we're going to show PFS and then later we show OS to where now it's all about, we show PFS and that's good enough and we move on. Uh, There could be uh, situations where that is actually sufficient, you know, in rare diseases where it is very difficult to go and prove um, benefit in terms of a randomized trial, especially you already find a drug that works it becomes unethical to go and do a randomized trial to put patients on something that we all know will not do or to put them on placebo. So that is an impossible task to fulfill. But there are other situations where I think doing confirmatory trials will be very, very important. And that is where the FDA would have to find uh, the authority and the, the, you know, the incentive to, you know, ensure that companies actually do follow through on the necessary trials. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're talking to uh, Tafik Mawanikoko, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Cambium Oncology LLC and vice chairman of Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. It's been wonderful talking to you and uh, thank you so much for being on our program. Thank you so much for having me. Great pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Moss Report. Visit our website at themossreport.com and subscribe to hear more discussion of cancer treatment options, alternative research, and more. For more information about Dr. Moss and his work, including scheduling phone consultations, go to mossreports.com.